All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, can every, everybody hear me in the back? Okay, so if I start uh, uh, getting in the audible, just do the little can't hear you thing, and we'll, I'll try to talk up. Uh, so we're going to talk about ECMO, and call this a high-level introduction and review. So for a lot of you people, you've done ECMO, and some of you, you may not quite know what it even means. So it's going to be hard to put together a talk that covers the entire spectrum from I don't know what it is, so I've already done it a lot, but we'll try to do that. So for some of you, this will be a review. I hope to add some new, con new things for everybody, and for some of you, a lot of new stuff. Uh, I'm not getting paid by any of the companies that manufacture any of the stuff, and I will be talking about some off-label use of some of the products. And a lot of things we want to get out of this, but uh, we're gonna, when we're done, uh, we're knowing a lot more about circuits, VV and VA, also VVA circuits. We'll know about the conditions that might benefit from a patient being managed with ECMO. We'll talk about the risks and potential benefits of ECMO in various clinical circumstances. We'll know a little bit more about um, how to interpret blood gases drawn from various locations and various configurations, and hopefully you can apply this to uh, bedside management of your patient. Oh, um, this, uh, what, one more thing here. Um, I will have time at the end for questions. If I say something, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's like, what, what, what was that? Raise your hand. I may have said it wrong, or you may just not have understood it, in which case it's important for me to, to uh, talk a little bit more about it. I don't want to go through the end and somebody says, well, what's a vein? Uh, so, uh, you know, ask questions and we'll, we'll be happy to, to take those. But if you have some really big, you know, what about use of ECMO in outer space, save that for the end. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about those uh, towards the end. I hope to have some time. Um, we're going to talk about um, basic concepts of nomenclature, equipment, definitions, and then a whole series of, uh, we'll break down VV ECMO, VV, VA ECMO, and VVA ECMO. I'll talk a little bit about anticoagulation. So what is ECMO? Well, it's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So it just simply means we take blood out of the body, that's the extracorporeal part of it, run it over what's called a membrane oxygenator, and that's actually a slight misnomer. It does add oxygen, it also removes carbon dioxide, which is the other important part of lung function. So although this was historically called a membrane oxygenator and still is, that's only because that was its initial indication. Had the initial indication been removing carbon dioxide for people with end-stage hypercarbic respiratory failure, we wouldn't call it. We call it extracorporeal membrane CO2 removal, which actually does exist. It's called ECOR. So you can. So this is. It does both, but um, we call it oxygenator nonetheless. And then we pump that blood back to the body. Depending on where we pump the blood back, we either get what's called VV or VA or some other combination of those. And the equipment basically has got a series of cannulas. We got a pump, we got an oxygenator. And you probably heard the term French relating to size. I did not know what French really meant until I started doing ECMO. It turns out it's millimeters divided by three. Uh, actually, seven, I'm sorry, centimeters divided by three. My bad centimeters divided by three. So if something is, let me, millimeters. So if something is 30 millimeters across, it's 10 French. It's just simply millimeters divided by three. It's all it is, okay? It's, um, I don't know the history of that. Oh, there are different kinds of pumps. We use exclusively something called centrifugal pumps. Those are little whirly pumps that we see. There's also, in some mostly pediatric centers still, and historically, we were called roller head pumps. These are these great big, um, they took the tubing, and there was a roller that basically smished the tubing. You have roller pump technology in some of your IV pumps, but these were great big um, uh, pumps that smished the great big tubing and pushed the blood along that way. That has been replaced by centrifugal for a lot of reasons. A big part of it is safety. If you had an outflow obstruction and a roller that was still turning, it would explode the tubing and you could burst it, it's called a raceway um, um, disaster, the patient died. Um, so we don't have that technology uh, here, we never have had it. Dell still uses that uh, some for their program. So there, was, that technology still is out there. If you read about it, it's like, well, why don't we have that? There are good reasons not to have it. Ours is exclusively centrifugal. And the other piece of equipment that's big is the oxygenator, and we'll talk about that. 
there's a bunch of terms that we use that I in ECMO that we, we thought a lot about how to name things so we don't get things confused with other um, parts of the circuit and other things we're doing. So I've already used the word cannula. Those are the great big tubes. And we try to use that as the term to distinguish it from all the other things we put into patients. So we're talking about the ECMO cannula. So those are the great big tubes that go in and out of the veins and arteries. Flow refers to blood flow through the circuit, not gas flow through the circuit. So flow is blood flow. It's measured in liters per minute. It typically is in the range of three to five liters. It's about what we usually have for most patients. There's sometimes we do more as we're weaning patients or if somebody's small, we might do less, but generally that's about the range. Sweep is a term that we use for gas flow over the oxygenator. So if I say, what's the flow? Um, there's obviously potential for confusion. Am I talking about the gas flow? Am I talking about the circuit flow? It's probably best if I clarified what I meant, but the term sweep refers to the gas flow. That's also in liters per minute. And the sweep gas can be whatever gas one wants to use, but we use oxygen. Now there are some places that occasionally will bleed in carbon dioxide also. There may be a time when the sweep gas that you use needs to have a little bit of carbon dioxide to help manage the PCO2 in the patient. We've never run across that scenario in the five years we've been doing ECMO, but some programs find it occasionally beneficial. So you can bleed in whatever you want. You can also use less than full 100% oxygen. You can use a mixture of oxygen and room air and have 80% or 70%. In VB, we almost always use 100% oxygen. In VA, we often use less. And we'll talk more about why that work, why that is later on. So uh, sweep gases, sweep, the sweep flow rate varies. Um, it can be as low as just a couple liters per minute. As the oxygenator gets older, gets used more, gets some cloths on it, it doesn't work quite as well, and we have to co up on the rate, and we can be at 10 or 11 liters per minute. Okay? Um, so it will be more variable. Both of these values, <coughs> the flow and the sweep, um, are analogous to what you get in a patient in terms of having blood flow through the heart and gas flow, and uh, blood flow through the heart and lungs and gas uh, exchange uh, in the lungs. So minute ventilation, how much air do we breathe in a minute? That is completely analogous to the sweep here. So if you are on a ventilator and the PCO2 is high, we would turn up the minute ventilation. You might turn up the tidal volume, turn up the rate to blow off carbon dioxide. In ECMO, if the CO2 is high, we turn up the sweep. More gas goes over the oxygenator, removes more carbon dioxide, the PCO2 will come down. And it, it conversely, we turn down the sweep, so we'd expect less carbon dioxide removal, and the PCO2 will go up. Okay? And then pressure. We have a variety of pressures we can measure in our circuit. We can measure those um, uh, before the oxygenator, after the oxygenator, or sort of back in the um, uh, tubing that goes into the oxygenator. And these are um, various pressures that will tell us a little bit about uh, how hard it is to basically suck the blood out of the patient, and how hard is it to push the blood through the oxygenator, and how high is the resistance across the oxygenator. So a brand new oxygenator will have a very low resistance as the oxygenator starts to fill up with uh, clot. The circuit pressures will rise, the pressure drop across the oxygenator will go up. And there's, these are things that we follow on a daily basis. Actually, we follow them actually hourly, but we you need to keep track of them. They usually don't rise acutely, but they can. And these can be early signs of uh, disaster waiting to happen is uh, pressure changes that are not explained by anything else that you've done to the patient. Um, pressure changes help us identify cannula malpositions, intravascular volume depletions, and oxygenator problems as well as impending failure of the oxygenator. Okay. And, and one of the problems of putting together one of these talks is there's a lot of basics that right now are gonna make no sense. So if you don't even know what the circuit looks like, this is all gobbledygook. But if I then do it the other way around and start showing you a bunch of circuit stuff, we can even talk about it without knowing what these are. So there's a chicken and the egg problem. So I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, ECMO is incredibly complicated. 
the first time we did one of these, none of us knew what we were doing. We literally were reading what's called the Red Book. It's, a, it's, a, it's a about a 350-page book on how to do ECMO. And our first patient, before we started in a formal program, I was sitting there reading the book as to how to take care of this patient that we had. After that, we decided I better actually learn, to learn what we were doing. And we started a formal program. But th this is very complicated. It took us a long time to wrap our heads around how this all works and understand it. And now we're pretty good at it. I don't expect you to leave understanding everything that's in here. This is a listen to it, learn some, get confused by other stuff, read it again, ask questions when you see me the next time, uh, ask questions when you're your next patient with it. This is an ongoing process and eventually you'll get so easy you wonder why did I not understand it the first time? You won't understand it the first time. Nobody does. We didn't. Okay? So just that's just the way ECMO is. It's complicated stuff. So this is a um, little cutaway of an oxygenator. So on the left is an actual, what an oxygenator looks like. And we basically have um, blood goes in and blood comes out and oxygen goes in and oxygen comes out. And actually all it says oxygen on here, it's actually gas. And that gas, that gas can be oxygen, the oxygen nitrogen mixture, and rarely, rarely, rarely it could be oxygen nitrogen mixture with some carbon dioxide added, but we've never done that. And the technology that makes this work are these, this is a sort of a microscopic cartoon of the inside of it. And there are these little fibers that are hollow and the blood goes around the fibers and gas goes through them. And these are made of polymethylpentene, which is a remarkable product that is semi-permeable. It lets gas go through very easily, but you don't get very much um, albumin and liquids and stuff seeping in. The first oxidators were leaky. And at the end of just a few hours, there was liquid just dripping out of the oxygenators, and then they basically all plugged up and didn't work anymore. These don't do that unless something's broken. So unless one of these fibers breaks and blood gets in, we don't get blood out of it, we don't get liquid out of it, we don't get albumin out of it. And it will slowly bugger up and get little clots on it and get to the point it doesn't exchange gas well. But uh, it, it can last uh, many days and sometimes even weeks. And the reason that this works with low flow, uh, works with low pressure, is because the, the blood goes around these tubes rather than through them. The pressure um, uh, or resistance that it takes to go through a tubing is very much uh, a function of the diameter of the tubing. And these tubes are very small. This uh, says 200 microns uh, across, a very small tube. You try to put blood through tubes that size, pressure is enormous and we, we wouldn't be able to do it. But air goes through that very easily. So we can run air through it at low, at low pressure and we have a lot more space out here for the blood to flow. So this is actually a very low pressure circuit where we can run on a fresh um, circuit, we can run four or five liters through it with a pressure drop of only 20 or 25 millimeters mercury, which is really pretty good. Now that will go up as the circuit gets older, but at the beginning it's really pretty nice. Now there's VV versus VA. Now there's other things, we will talk about VVA later, and there's all sorts of configurations that can be put together. But the big ones are VV versus VA. And VV is vena venous, VA is vena arteria. In both of these, you take blood out of the venous circuit, hence the first V blood removed from the venous circuit, where? Well, we want to take it out of a big vein. Take it out of a small vein, like you're in the cubo, you're not going to get much blood flow, okay? So we take it out of the SVC or the IVC or both. And then we return it again to the venous circuit. So we take it out of the vein, put it back in the vein. Which one? We typically put it around the right atrium. So we suck it out of the vena cava, either above or below the right atrium or both, and then return it to the right atrium. It's important to recognize that that configuration will add oxygen and remove carbon dioxide, but does not provide any direct cardiac support because you're just putting the blood right back on the right side where you took it out. If the right part or left part don't work, you haven't done anything for that, not directly. 
And the reason I say directly is that, let's say the patient has a PO2 of 30 and a SAT of 58 or 60, how well is his left heart going to be working when it's in a horrendously hypoxic condition? Not real well, okay? So you may have a hypoxic heart that's not beating real well. And if you can provide oxygen to the VV circuit, then the left heart is going to get a lot happier. The other thing that can happen is often patients with respiratory failure have very high thoracic pressures. We've been beating them up with a ventilator. The ventilator pressures are high. You don't get good blood return to the chest because the pressures are high. We put you on ECMO. One of the first things we do is turn down the ventilator to save pressures. So now we have pressures that have gone from 40 down to 20 or 25 in the chest. We're now providing oxygen to the heart. And suddenly, that patient who's on three pressures maybe doesn't need anything. Okay? So if you have a fundamentally failing heart, ECMO will be the ECMO will not work. If you have a, a, a heart that's not happy because of high ventilator pressures or because of hypoxia, BV ECMO by itself may support a failing heart. Make sense? And, th and that's a, one of the big decision points we have on every patient is a BV or VA. And sometimes we say, you know, maybe VA, but I think BV might be enough. So we'll start BV. We can always add a VA circuit if we need to. And then VA, you know, arterial, Blood is removed just like it is for VV, typically, SVC, IVC, or both. Although occasionally, the surgeon will be in the chest, they've just done an operation, and maybe they suck it out of the pulmonary vein or the left atrium, and then they return the blood somewhere on the arterial circuit. And that could be the femoral artery, axillary artery, aortic root, any great big artery you can hook into the work. Some are faster than others, depends on whether you're already in the chest, depends on how stable your patient is, are you doing CPR at the time, all sorts of questions. But that's VA. And then, so BB, suck out of the vein, return to the vein, VA, suck out of an artery, suck out of the vein, return to an artery. Okay? Important distinctions. And they're completely different in how they, how they function and support the patient and the things that we use them for. Now this is a little cartoon of a um, VV ECMO setup. And this shows blood being removed from the IVC in this patient, coming out of the right femoral, going through the oxygenator, coming in initially purple and coming out nice and red, and then getting pumped back in uh, to the um, um, right atrium. This particular drawing, you notice that there's some blue lines at the top. Um, that would be a, you know, if you had a, um, um, the reason for that is that is blue blood that is um, coming in from above that has not become part of the uh, oxygenator circuit. So what we've got is, sorry about that. This gets confusing, but what we've got in the, in the heart, okay, we've got IVC and SVC. If we're sucking out of the SVC, out of the IVC, out of the inferior vena cava, that means that we're missing some of the superior vena cava blood. That blood is not going to be part of the ECMO circuit. We're going to be returning red blood to the right atrium, which is then going to get mixed with whatever blood came from the SVC that we didn't capture in our circuit. So what's going to go out to the patient is actually not going to be completely bright red. It's going to be a combination of bright red from the oxygenator coupled with whatever blood we missed. So right off the bat, we're never going to get 100% sats routinely in BB ECMO land because there's always going to be some blood that mixes in with our ECMO circuit blood that did not go through the circuit. And that mixing is going to lower our sats. Just going to happen. You can have 100% sat coming out of the oxygenator, but you're not going to get 100% sat on the left side of the patient. Now the VA schematic here, and this shows blood being taken um, out of, again, the right femoral vein. And then it's being returned in this case, to the um, femoral artery. 
and it's going up the aorta and we're actually perfusing the patient retrograde. So in this circumstance, the patient's being supported with blood going the wrong direction. Turns out the body doesn't really care. Okay? It doesn't really mind that that's happening, um, which is pretty cool. Um, something we'll talk a lot more as we go on today, so they start thinking about this particular scenario, this heart isn't pumping. We show blood coming all the way back up to right there. But let's say this heart was pumping and beating and ejecting. We'd have some blood coming out of the left ventricle and it would be coming up the aorta, running into blood coming from below. So we have blood coming up the ascending aorta and down. We have blood coming from below and going up. And if the lungs are bad, then the blood that's being pumped out of that ventricle is going to be blue. You have blue blood coming out of the heart, meaning red, meaning red blood that's going up the aorta. And you run into the possibility that you actually have blue blood going to the patient's brain and red blood going to the lower part of the body. And we've seen this many times. And we'll talk more about that. So we're not going to, again, I'm just going to hit some of these things over and over again because this gets phenomenally complicated, hard to get your head around sometimes. But in VA ECMO, where you've got a circuit coming from below where you're perfusing the aorta retrograde, if the heart isn't pumping, then the entire aorta and all of its branches will be filled with blood coming out of the oxygenated circuit. Everything will be nice and red. But if the heart is pumping, then you've got blood that's not through the lungs coming out, just like we all have in this room right now. If your lungs are fine, everything's going to be okay. If your lungs are damaged, then you've got hypoxic blood coming out of the heart that's in competition with blood coming out of the echo circuit. And somewhere there'll be a break point. And before that break point, on either side of it, one side's going to be blue and one side will be red. Okay? Sort of makes sense. We'll talk more about that. So I'm just going to let you, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this slide. That'll just be in your packet for later look. Okay, let's talk more about VV ECMO since that's our main ECMO. And there are a lot of ways of doing this. Uh, we use, when possible, <coughs> in ideal patients where we have the luxury of some time, and Avalon, that's a brand name, but generically it's a bicable double lumen cannula. It's placed through the right internal jugular, and when it's properly placed, you can drain blood from the patient from both the SVC and the IVC. So you, return, you take it out of both the SVC and IVC, and then it is returned to the right atrium. It's relatively difficult to place properly. It does allow greater patient mobility, which is really nice. You don't have to put things in the groin, which is really good. And it's our preferred cannula if we have the time and the anatomy to facilitate it. Okay. Now our other standard VV approach is what we call FemFem. -fem. This is two cannulas, one placed into the femoral vein, typically around the hepatic IVC, and that's to remove blood. So this is a large cannula with lots of holes in it reposition the hepatic IVC and drains blood from that region, misses the SVC completely, just the hepatic. And the other one we place in the other femoral vein and we advance it to the right atrium and that's the return. So we take it out of the hepatic IVC, return to the right atrium. We miss the blood that's in the SVC. So we're going to have some SVC blood that is going to mix with our ECMO circuit blood. Okay. This is easier to place. The anatomy is more straightforward, less to go wrong, very quick. We can do it in a transport situation. You don't have to have real-time fluoroscopy to properly place. You don't have to have uh, echocardiogram, echocardiogram to place. And it's our preferred cannulation strategy in emergency or transport situations. Um, we often will then transfer, uh, transition the patient when more stable <coughs> to uh, Avalon cannula from above. Okay, so we have a patient right now in ICC-3 who had 
less than ideal anatomy. We made a decision to put him on Fem-Fem last night rather than um, uh, Avalon. We'd rather have had an Avalon, but we have serious concerns about his anatomy and felt that it would be safer to stabilize him on Fem-Fem. And then we can sort out the details later. And if we need to transition to an Avalon, we can look into that possibility at a later time in a more stable patient. So this is a cutaway cartoon of a properly positioned Avalon. And uh, how many of you have not seen an Avalon? Okay. Uh, it's a huge cannula. The biggest one is um, uh, uh, 31 millimeter diameter, so we're talking about uh, uh, over a centimeter large um, um, uh, tube. Uh, I'm sorry, 31. Uh, so anyway, an over an inch. Give my think. Yeah, it's a centimeter. It's a. It's a. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's. Um, 11 millimeters, it's over a centimeter in size. Um, it's the size of that cannula. Um, it is enormous and can do major hurt if improperly placed. And that this has happened in every center that places up of these. You will hurt somebody putting these in. Um, scary, scary, scary dilators. Um, the, everybody here has probably seen a central line placed and you know that as you're putting the line in, put the wire in too far, it often goes into the heart and starts getting some ectopy. The wires want to go that direction. Well, for putting in a, putting a patient on uh, ECMO with an Avalon, you don't want to go that direction. You want the wire to go straight down and into the IVC. You don't want the wire to go around to the heart. That actually is the hardest part of this whole procedure is under fluoroscopy, manipulating those wires so instead of going into the heart, they go down the IVC. Then you have a wire from the neck all the way down the IVC. You put a series of enormous dilators in until you get one. You've seen the dilators that we use for triple lumen. Well, if we're talking about a dilator at the end, it's almost a centimeter in diameter. Okay, so huge. Yes? Do you, do you ever see tricuspid issues, like long term after? The cannula has been sitting in there for so, a while? So the, the, the cannula actually doesn't cross the tricuspid valve. Now it does have a, a jet that aims at the tricuspid mm -hmm. valve and we have never recognized important tricuspid abnormalities from that. Okay. So we have a wire going all the way down, a series of scary big dilators and then finally this is put in over the wire and when properly positioned the tip is in the hepatic IVC and we can drain blood from here and drain blood from here and we return blood into the right atrium from this cannula. This is not our patient but looks a lot like one of ours except for the fact that they've mushed this poor person's ear. <laughs> they at least recognize it and put a little piece of padding on it but it's, uh, they got two ties here and they just mushed that, just mushed that poor person's ear. So, um, that's not us. Another cartoon of what this looks like. So again, properly positioned cannula. There's a drain at the bottom. There's a drain higher up. And those are the outflow. And then here is the right atrial port that when properly positioned, jets blood out towards the right, uh, into the right atrium and in the direction of the tricuspid valve. So hopefully we have standard pressure gradients that blood flows from here through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, right ventricle contracts, and now it's squeezing pre-oxygenated blood. So remember the blood that normally the right ventricle squeezes into the lungs is blue blood having come from the body in this case, though, it's going to be blood that is highly oxygenated. So it's already taken blood that has carbon dioxide removed from it and has had oxygen added to it. So whether the lungs do anything or not doesn't matter too much because it's already been through the lungs. Just the outside lungs is what it's been through. We have lungs in parallel. We have, we have ECMO lung followed by your lungs. And if your lungs don't work, it doesn't matter. That's what the ECMO is for. As the lungs start getting better, we can, we need this less and less. Okay? 
So that's how VDF works. It provides hyperoxygenated blood that has already had carbon dioxide removed to the right atrium and right ventricle, allowing that blood to be pumped through your dysfunctional lungs and out to the body. Okay? That's fundamentally the concept here. And anybody not understand that, because we don't, we, it's time to take a short break and explain that. So if you understand that, then BB doesn't make any sense. Understand what we're doing there? Okay. And that's just more pretty pictures you can look at on your own. Now this is a patient we just recently did, and this is FemFem. And this cannula that is on the patient's right is stopping right there in the region of the hepatic IVC. That's the drain. And then the other cannula that's longer and positioned around the right atria, that's the return. As it turns out, the cannula we're using there has a radiolucent tip. So the tip on the actual cannula is a little further out than what you see. And they're not quite as close. So that's the return, and the other one's the drain. Now, something to remember is there is a concept in ECMO called recirculation. And recirculation is what happened, recirculation is what happens if the blood that's coming out of the ECMO return is sucked back in the drain. In which case, some of that blood just spins around. It comes out here, sucked in there, runs through the circuit, jets out here. Some of it goes in the heart, but some of it gets sucked back out. If these cannulas were too close together, then whatever came out of one would just suck into the other. Anybody here ever used a pick line? Yeah. Anybody here ever seen the end of a pick? We've got three ports right next to each other. So if you've got stuff going out of one and you draw blood out of the other, you're just sucking back. That's called that's recirculation. And you're just sucking what came out of one IV into the other one. Same thing here. So if these are too close together, we'll get recirculation. And the way you can tell this is happening is a couple things. One, you're going to be sending less blood to the patient. The patient's sats might start to go down. But the other thing that will happen is that the color of the blood that you're removing from the patient will start to become increasingly red. In a properly functioning VD circuit, you have dark blood coming out of the patient and red blood going to the patient. If they're both red, something's wrong. Okay, if they're both red, something's wrong. What could that be? So we'll just think about that, so we'll talk about that later. But think about the causes of both of those tubes being red. Okay, blood gas interpretation on a DV echo. Time for the respiratory therapist to wake up. Um, so we've got several places we can draw blood. We have pre-oxygenator gas, post-oxygenator gas, and patient gases. Those are fundamentally the three ways we can draw blood gases on BV ECMO. So we can draw blood from the patient. We can draw blood before they pump. Oh, sorry, before the oxygenator. We can draw blood after the oxygenator. These are tell us different things. Pre-oxygenator gas in BV land is only of marginal utility. And the reason is it's a mixture of blood that has gone through the circuit and been recirculated, coupled with blood returning from the patient. So there's gonna be a combination of those things. So we're sucking blood out. And that's gonna be kind of analogous to a central venous sac. But it's always gonna be higher because there will always be some degree of recirculation. So in a patient who has stable everything, that number ought to be relatively stable. If anything increases recirculation, that number is going to go up. And if anything changes all the things that make central venous sats go down, that will go down. But in general, it's not a terribly useful value, but can be at times. And increasing recirculation, as you can think about what can cause it, cannula malposition. 
So the fact that the cannulas are in one place today doesn't mean they'll be there tomorrow. They can be pulled or pushed. Falling cardiac output. So think about this for a second. Just take the extreme case of the patient has no cardiac output. His heart has stopped and you're on VV. Well, if we're turning four liters to the right atrium and say the heart's not pumping. So none of that's going out, right? So the four liters that you suck back is going to be the same four liters you just returned. And it's just gone through the circuits, so it's bright red. So as your patient's cardiac output goes down and he starts to die on you, the color of the blood coming out of the patient will go redder and redder and redder. Now you're that used to thinking, you know, you've had patients that you've got a swan in, his cardiac output's falling, you draw a central venous sac, and what happens to it? It's getting darker and darker. And you all know that if you draw some blood out of a sick heart patient and it's like, you know, the color of your scrubs, something's bad wrong, right? This same patient you draw it and it's bright red, bad wrong. Okay, because you have recirculation. Exactly the opposite of what you're used to. That's one of the things that makes ECMO kind of fun and confusing. And the other thing is increased circuit flow. The higher you, tur higher you turn up your flow rate, the more likely you're going to get some turbulence and some flow that doesn't go where you want and some of it spills back. So if we are, um, let's go back to this panel. So if we really turn up this flow really, really high, it's not hard to imagine that we're putting more into that right atrial space than can go through into the ventricle. So some of it's going to sort of go up the SVC or down the IVC and get sucked out. So you see another patient at four liters and you decide to crank it up as high as it'll go, let's say to six and a half, you might find that that actually increases your recirculation more and you may not get the benefit that you expected. Okay. So the pre gas is not the same as a central venous gas and it only roughly correlates. And these gases are very hard to interpret and you cannot calculate a cardiac output using so-called FIC while on VV ECMO. Because it's got too many, I mean, first of all, if you had a PA factor in, the values you're going to get will be all post um, oxygenator will have ridiculously high sats. And you can't use the value coming out of the oxygenator because it has recirculation. So cardiac output fix on BB don't work. Okay? Now the post oxygenator gas um, tells you how well your oxygenator is working. And you can use that to make some adjustments in sweeps. But basically, it's something we use that tells us whether our oxygenator is working well. And if we find over time that our PO2 coming out of the oxygenator on the same settings is falling from 450 down to 100, well, it's still working. I'm still getting plenty of oxygen, but we're not much farther before we have a problem. It's important to remember this is a venous gas in the most bright red. And some people refer to it as arterial because it's being pumped out of the pump and it's bright red. It's a venous gas. It's simply the proper labeling for our purposes is we have venous pre-oxygenator, we have venous post-oxygenator. And they're not arterial just because they're bright red and under pressure. Okay? And that's really, really, really important. Especially when we get into VA, where we got all sorts of places to draw from. It's really critically important that these get labeled our teams know what the label is and get put into compass appropriately as with appropriate labels as VV, as venous pre-oxygenator, venous post-oxygenator. And if you have a patient gas, it's critically important that we see where it came from. As we'll see when we get into GA, right radial may be completely different than left radial gases. Really need to have those labeled properly. And this post-oxygenator gas will change depending on the sweep, um, sweep composition, the FiO2 how old the oxygenator is, how much clot is in there, how much blood flow we have going through it, and what the pre-oxygenator gas was. So depending on how good or bad the gas going in, that will have some effect on the gas coming out, or the blood coming out, okay? Now what we really care about, of course, is the patient. And so we have a patient gas. Remember, the patient ABG on VV ECMO is a combination of what you get from 
the ECMO blood that mixes with blood in the patient that then goes through the lungs and is further modified there. So worsening and improving patient values will be a combination of how well your oxygenator is working, how much blood that you're missing, so SVC or IVC blood that does not go through the circuit, coupled with um, how well or badly the patient's lungs are working in terms of adding more oxygen and removing carbon dioxide from that blood that has already that, that has been pumped in. So there's a lot of things that can be happening. So if you see that the patient's PO2 was 85 last night and this morning was 55, well, there's a lot of things. Did the circuit change? Did the uh, flow change in the circuit? Did we change the sweep? Did we change the sweep gas composition? Has the patient's cardiac output changed? Has the <coughs> annual positions changed? Is the oxygenator working properly? Does the patient have a fever? There's all sorts of things that can cause that to happen. Okay? Again, this is just an introductory talk to get you thinking along these lines for all sorts of things. So worsening oxygenation, sweep gas can be disconnected, the oxygenator can be not working, the cannulas can be malpositioned, uh, perhaps leading to increased recirculation. Uh, circuit blood flow may have, maybe the patient was having chatter and the perfusion has turned down the uh, uh, circuit flow. Uh, fever and agitation increase <coughs> oxygen utilization. Anemia causes uh, uh, low central venous sats. All sorts of things can be uh, playing a role here. Okay. So why would we even want to do this to somebody? What are the indications for ECMO? Well, <coughs> for VV, potentially reversible severe hypoxemic respiratory failure. I say potentially because we don't have crystal balls. You never know whether somebody's going to get better. But if they're not going to get better, we don't want to do this. And the goal here is to say, hey, let's see how long we keep this person going before he dies. That's, that's not the goal of that goal. The goal is to get somebody, keep somebody alive so they can heal up and go home. So things that are potentially reversible, ARDS, bacterial or viral pneumonia, Fungals can be done, the prognosis is awful. Probably because of the things that produce fungal pneumonias, but very bad outcomes for that. I would still be willing to consider it in selected patients, but prognosis is grim. Aspiration, smoke inhalation, airway obstruction. We have a, we have a um, um, poster in the hallway of um, using ECMO to support um, uh, procedures uh, for um, uh, dealing with uh, airway obstruction. Potentially reversible hypercarbic respiratory failure, we have done rarely, but I would do it in a flash in the right patient. So severe asthma that can't be ventilated would be a classic indication. And possibly COPD, that's actually being looked into, um, and it's a big push in Europe to investigate whether or not people with COPD exacerbations who normally would be intubated might be better served with um, low flow ECMO. Um, and what's called ECOR, which is uh, ECMO for carbon dioxide removal. And ECMO CO2 removal um, um, may, if properly selected patients, be a good way to manage these people. So instead of being on a ventilator and tied down and all the issues that go with that, you have a relatively small IJ uh, Avalon um, cranked up to remove CO2 and uh, placed, you know, instead of being intubated, you get that put in. You have an awake alert patient with a tube in his neck and he's eating and walking around getting rehabbed uh, while his uh, COPD exacerbation goes away. So that's actually may turn into uh, something that we will be doing. The data is not quite supported yet, um, in part because it's hard to predict and select the proper patients for that. But uh, that's an active area of research. Now, why would this be something worth doing in this population of patients? What's the rationale? Well, the short-term answer is only part of it. The short, obvious answer is, well, it keeps you from dying of hypoxemia. So if you've got horrendous hypoxemic respiratory failure, I can provide oxygen and don't die of hypoxemia. That's great. But what's really important, we think, is that we can turn the ventilator down to safe settings. 
Don't forget, to keep these people alive with bad ARDS, we have to do a lot of things that are basically damaging to the lungs. We use pressures and volumes that damage the lungs. We use high FiO2, that damages the lungs. So you've got a patient whose lungs have been damaged, and these damaged lungs we then damage further, and it's like coming in with a burn, and somebody says, I know what to do, put hot water on it. Well, you know, bad idea. But that's what we do with, that's what we do with ventilators, is we turn up the, um, we, we keep the damage going. With ECMO, we can turn the ventilator down, we turn the FO2 down, turn the pressures down, and hopefully stop the ongoing damage and let the lungs heal. So these are um, uh, CT and autopsy, patient did not do well, uh, pictures from a person who spent eight weeks, not, a, not our center, uh, eight weeks with high volume ventilation and high peak pressures. Now these peak pressures may sound ridiculous to you and they are in the modern era. But I can tell you that uh, when I started training in medicine, these were standard uh, settings and standard pressures in the bad ARDS. And this is what happened to the lungs. You blew them out, you had pneumatoceles, they were absolutely destroyed. If you take, a, take uh, rats um, and remove their lungs and hook them up to um, high pressure ventilation, ex vivo, out of the, out of the rat, um, in just a short period of time, this is uh, 20 minutes, that lung, instead of looking like a lung, just looks like a beat up piece of liver. And it's not hard to imagine that lung's not going to work very well. So our whole goal here is to support the patient and turn down the ventilator, let the lungs heal up, and then hopefully get them off of their ECMO. So we'll start talking a little bit about management of these VV ECMO patients. And you've got the patient has been put on ECMO, and my philosophy is until they get back to the ICU, don't rock the boat. We're not going to make changes in the ambulance. We're not going to make changes in the operating room. We're not going to make changes in the hallway. So the patient's ventilator settings are high and dangerous. He can live another 20 minutes with them. Uh, I may turn down a little bit, but not very much. Most of these patients will already be on a neuromuscular blocker and heavily sedated initially. We don't try to keep them that way, but initially they usually are. And the initial gases look amazing because you've got poisonous vent settings coupled with ECMO, and that equals wonderful gases. And it's like, oh, look at this, PO2 is 200, the CO2 is 35, aren't we great? Um, it does feel pretty good, but that's really what happens. But remember, the key to success here is not to have great gases. The key to success is to have ventilator settings that allow the lungs to have some chance of healing. So after the patient gets back to the ICU and is a little stable, first thing I do, I turn down the ventilator. And I'll typically use settings, something like a PIPA 10, and then uh, bi-level or pressure control or some setting that controls peak pressures, typically having peak pressures no higher than 20 to 25. So instead of having peak pressures of 35 and 40 and 45 and 50, which we've seen on some transports, we bring them down to 20 or 25 and turn the FO2 down. When this happens, the total volume of the patient plummets. And sometimes it goes down to zero. Sometimes there is no ventilation at all. And we've had patients that I can always put them on the TPs because there's no ventilation. Other times we have ventilation, it's just low volume. Now, <coughs> the result of turning down the ventilator and removing the ventilator from it means you're completely dependent on, on ECMO. And often, as we mentioned, because of the fact that we don't capture all of the blood that goes to the ECMO circuit, we have a mixing of blood that is patient's central venous blood mixing with ECMO blood. The end result is SATs will not be 100. They may be in the 80s. Sometimes they may be in the 70s. Nobody here wants to have low SATs. But we don't want to destroy the lungs any further. We are willing to accept low SATs on these patients we typically don't get worried about SATs over 80. Okay? So would we like to see a SAT of 94? That would be great. Am I okay with a SAT of 82 in the right setting? Absolutely. 
and some centers don't even have a problem with 75 and 76. Makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. But uh, the data is really very good. You need to have the lungs uh, heal up or you're not going to do well. So tidal volumes fall, and like I said, they may reach zero. Interthoracic pressures go down, that improves venous return, improves cardiac output. Often we get people off the pressors at that point. Because the volumes are down, the lung contribution to gas exchange decreases, and the blood gases will get worse. So the best gas you're going to have is that initial one in the operating room or the initial one post cannulation. And then we turn things down, and like the gases, you know, what happened? PO2 sucks, PCO2 is higher, what, 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 what's going wrong? Nothing's going wrong, it's going good. We're now, for the first time, able to get that patient on the road to healing. For the first time. Okay. This is actually a screenshot. Patient's tachycardic, status 72, febrile, hypertensive, pre ECMO. Heart rate down, blood pressure, okay. Set a 94, temperature lower. He's on ECMO. This is his ventilator. Anybody notice anything funny on this ventilator? Or unusual? And you don't, you don't all have to speak at once. Sorry? Total volume here is 27. Minute ventilation is 0.43 liters. Okay, great pressures. Peak pressure of 22. Okay, no damage to the lungs occurring, and no ventilation at all. So, patient is 94% sat. Pretty good. With no lung function. Now, had this number been 82, what changes would I have made on his care? Probably nothing. I'm going to look to see whether I could treat fever, which we, he wasn't febrile, and make sure his hemoglobin is pretty good, those sort of things. But I'm not going to change anything on the ventilator. I am tickled pink with his ventilator settings. This patient somebody who I don't know what happened. I don't remember this particular patient. But these are settings that are consistent with not having any ongoing lung damage. And these are lungs that might get better. So as long as I can keep him alive, he has a chance of getting better. Yes? You said that the patient was hypertensive. Is there like a certain range that we're looking at for blood pressure while we're on the ECMO? No. No, VV, VV ECMO is just standard, uh, standard management. So um, this is early in this patient's management. Um, very soon after we started, um, we're still working on sedation and all sorts of things. Um, so I'm not afraid by hypertension. Now, if this were a VA patient, we we're trying to get cardiac recovery, and I had a um, uh, arterial pressure with a MAPA 95, that'd be a medical emergency. We would be putting them on metoprusside or something to get the blood pressure down or turning down the echo flow or turning down the epinephrine that he's on or something to try to treat that. In VV, it's just no different than a patient with pneumonia. So what blood pressure do you want for pneumonia? I mean, it's enough to confuse the patient well. Okay? And, and unless the patient was previously hypertensive, then most of your hypertension is not appropriately treated with blood pressure medicine. It's treated with sedation, pain control, those sort of things. So first and foremost, in VV land, you got hypertension. Unless the patient is known hypertensive, uh, it's your pressors that you've got them on still from the sepsis, or it's your um, lack of uh, propofol, or it's your lack of fentanyl, that's the problem. OK. Now, if the SATs are low, we can make sure the oxygenator is working. Is the, red, is the blood red coming out? If it is, your oxygenator is working. Verify cannula position to minimize recirculation. Increase circuit blood flow, although doing that too much may just increase recirculation. Manage fever, manage agitation. They're badly anemic transfuse. 
and except lower sets. Anything over 80 is almost certainly okay, sometimes lower. I said labeling gases and ECMO, you can draw from the patient of the circuit, BV. Uh, the circuit blood is almost always going to be venous. Venous pre oxygenator, venous post oxygenator, and even if it's bright red under pressure, PO2 of 500, it's venous if you do it from the venous line, period. And it's essential, it's essential if it's being labeled accurately. So you come back later and try to figure out what happened to that patient, what's going on, and you got certain you got gases that are mislabeled, it can lead to important uh, confusions. Now there's a middle phase of VB ECMO, and this basically goes from stabilization until recovery starts. And uh, we want to stop the neuromuscular blockade. We have the patient stabilized, we can off the neuromuscular blocker, decrease sedation as able. Depending on what's wrong with the patient, we may have profound dyspnea. So you have receptors in the lungs that aren't happy when the lungs aren't being inflated and stretched. And deflated lungs, you don't like. And if you got dyspnea, you got a sensation of not getting enough air to breathe, and you've got completely deflated, stiff lungs that cannot be inflated, so you're trying to breathe and those lungs don't inflate, that is highly anxiety provoking. And merely having good oxygenation and good carbon dioxide removal does not overcome that dyspnea in a lot of these people. They may need enormous doses of narcotics, huge amounts of sedation, and some people, depending on their condition, it is an enormous problem. It's not because they're nuts, it's because they feel like they can't breathe, and they're right. That they can't. And you'll see pictures of people ambulating on ECMO, and we've done that. And you'll get the idea sometimes that, oh, everybody with, you know, should be up and about and walking the next day. No, no center does that. Um, uh, people with bad ARDS and no tidal volume are profoundly dyspneic people, and it takes a lot of sedation, and it may be days and sometimes weeks before you get that person to a mental status and functioning well enough in terms of their dyspnea that you can start making progress there. I've uh, got to address nutrition, careful attention to all of the standard ICU details, you know, skin care and IV sites and all the little things that we want to do. And don't mush the ear and the Avalon. And all of those things need to be taken care of. Um, and then um, if we want to mobilize these people uh, carefully um, and a lot of things, um, you know, sometimes they tolerate moving very well, sometimes even slight movement leads to cannula flow issues, it's a case by case thing, uh, but we do want to mobilize them including uh, bed and chair, dangling out of bed and uh, potentially walking uh, in the selected proper patients. Um, infection is a big potential issue. These patients often don't have fever because we're uh, controlling temperature through the ECMO circuit, they're losing heat uh, by having you know, uh, four or five liters of blood a minute removed from the um, uh, body um, uh, and run through the circuit. So it, it can be challenging sometimes to recognize fever. And then um, uh, weaning from ECMO, the last phase, it's not really a weaning process. You either need ECMO or you don't. It's not an issue of, well, we'll have your lungs work a little bit more today, and maybe they'll get stronger. No, it doesn't work that way. Even if the lungs have recovered, well, the lungs happen. It's as simple as that. And we simply have to discover that. So what we'll see is the tidal volume on the same ventilator setting will improve. Instead of being 27, one day there'll be 100. And the next day, maybe 150. And the x-ray, instead of being completely opacified, oh, look, there's some air there. And the gases start getting better. On the same settings, we start noticing the PO2 is going up or the CO2 is going down. And that's because we've got the ECMO circuits doing the same thing, but now the lungs are doing a little bit more. So we'll start seeing improvement in gases as a clue. And something we've noticed is that oxygenation and ventilation sometimes heal at different rates. We've had patients who get oxygen very, very easily. If you turn down their ECMO, and they start breathing very fast, their ventilation goes through the roof, and their CO2 goes up. They can't exchange carbon dioxide, even though oxygen goes in and out fine, or vice versa. More often, we see oxygenation improve before ventilation. Okay? So the fact that oxygenation is improving doesn't mean that they're going to be off ECMO tomorrow, but they might be. 
when they start to improve, we change their ventilator settings, turn them back to more standard, not to poisonous settings, but to standard ventilator settings. I turn the sweep down. I typically I turn the sweep down by about, you know, half. And see what happens. I watch for 10 minutes. And sometimes they fail immediately. Okay, fine. Turn the sweep back up, turn the ventilator back down, try again another day. But if they do fine, I'll turn the uh, sweep off completely and watch. And if they keep doing fine, we do what's called tapping the circuit, where we make sure there's absolutely no chance of any air getting into the circuit and seeing how they do. And if they do fine, they don't need ECMO anymore. Again. You can get them off of it. Typically, we'll watch them for about a day before we do remove ECMO. It's such a big deal to put the patient on. I really don't want to take it out one afternoon and put it back in that night. It's not bad form. Uh, so, um, this is basically weaning. And some patients pass on their first attempt, and others after about a month. Just depends. Uh, if the patient fails, try to assess what the reasons are. Are they wet? Did they be diuresed? Did they be filtration? Are they septic? Is it anxiety or pain? Or is it just that the lungs are sick and it takes a long time to recover? And that's often the answer, but there may be another mechanism. Recovery can take days to months. Our longest successful VB ECMO was 83 days. The longest in the literature was 115. I am not disappointed that we did not make the, uh, uh, <laughs> the record, although I thought we might. Uh, I thought that that was a real possibility, but uh, we got off at 83. <coughs> How long should we wait for recovery? I think the answer now is a qualified as long as it takes. <coughs> I say qualified because we can go 83 days you don't want to go 83 days on somebody who's had three strokes and uh, has had all their fingers and toes amputated from sepsis and uh, the gut isn't working and everything's, you know, the wheels are falling off. But you got a patient who's awake and alert and uh, updating their Facebook page. Uh, it's kind of hard to say, well, yeah, it's been 83 days. They will just kill you today. It's kind of hard to do that. Um, so as long as it takes. And the literature supports that as long as it takes is probably the right answer. So you have properly selected patients who don't have contraindications to keep to continuing on and keep going. And the weird thing is you know, we're, we're off into an area that nobody ever was in before. We're talking about the natural history of something that never happened. What, what is the natural history of lung recovery following fatal illness? I mean, these people all were dead. Our 83 our 83 day patient was a dead woman. She would have died except for this. So how long does it take for hopelessly damaged lungs to get better? Well, it turns out they do get better. They're not hopelessly damaged. We were wrong. They can get better. And it turns out that when you watch, they will, the patient was 115 days. I saw a slide showing that patient's tidal volumes. Nothing happened for over three months. There was no tidal volumes. And then suddenly out of the blue after about three, three and a half months, the patient's start, lungs started working and then started getting volume and gas exchange and got off ECMO. Now, didn't have normal lungs, they're still badly damaged, but <coughs> enough to be off ECMO. And our 83-day patient still has damaged lungs, but, are, but they're getting better. So outpatient follow-up has improvement in lung function that is continuing. So again, we're into the natural history of a condition that we never knew what the natural history was because they died. So right now the answer is as long as it takes. Other aspects that are kind of beyond the scope of this discussion, we're not going to talk about prone versus ECMO. I'm going to take questions. We're not going to talk about that here. We're not talking about bending the rules on patient selection, tracheoscopy timing, mobilization in terms of the details, transport either both inter and intra facility. We're not going to talk about that. Family roles, expectations, and we're not going to go into details about e core. So this is, a, this is a skimming the surface talk. It may look like a lot of detail. These are a lot of things that each of those is another hour. We're not going to talk about those. We are going to do a quick case, though. So uh, this will be an audience participation, and I'll need help with that to see if it actually works. 62-year-old man diagnosed with IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, three years before. He's had steadily progressive dyspnea requiring oxygen at home. He's been evaluated for lung transplant. He's been seen in San Antonio and Dallas, and he's felt not to be a transplant candidate. I won't go into the details of why, he just isn't. He came to the hospital six days ago. 
progressive respiratory failure, now is on BiPAP, FO2 of 1.0 for past 48 hours, increasingly short of breath, stats are now in the upper 70s. He's on broad antibiotics empirically, although he doesn't really have any evidence of infection. He's on high dose steroids, although the literature on that is incredibly poor. But it's the old saying, nobody should die without a course of steroids, so he's on steroids. And we've been consulted for ECMO. And the question is, which cannulation strategy should be used for this patient? A, VV ECMO via right IJ approach with a 31 French cannula. Two, VV ECMO via fem fem approach using 25 French drain and 21 French return. C, it's a trick question, it should be VA ECMO. D, I have no clue what you're talking about. E, none of the above. And I think there is a mechanism to, so what are we, what am I supposed to do? Now? The next slide. The next slide won't have the answers, it's, it's your. Won't have the answers. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so text that number, or text that uh, phrase to that number, and then answer with whatever you want. So they're supposed to, so they're supposed to text SMCAECM00? Zero, zero? Yeah, SMCA ECMO 081 ah. to two, two, three, three. And then that part of oh, EMC. SMCA ECMO yeah. 081. So you text that. And we say to do that to 2233. Two, <coughs> so the number that you're texting to is 22333. Three, three. I don't understand this. Oh, I, oh so you, text, <laughs> you put oh, the number is 22. Two, so you put in the number 22333. That's, two, like three, three. that's how you do it. So it's ECMO. And then 081. So one person has already done this. <laughs> this is cool. I've never seen this happen, how this works. So. Oh, this is cool. Ooh, the numbers are changing. <laughs> oh. This is so much better than breaking the end. So that's good. Uh, I'm glad that um, a small number uh, had no idea. Uh, I'm also glad you're and we're honest because that's, that's important. Uh, the right answer is none of the above. And the reason is this patient is not a network candidate because this is a bridge, bridge to nowhere. Okay? This is an irreversible condition. There is no lung transplant in this patient's future. We can't make it get better. He's been treated for three years. He's getting worse. There's nothing reversible. We can keep him alive to die of an echo complication. Now, if this patient were on the transplant list in San Antonio, and we call them up and they say, yeah, if you can get him stable on ECMO, we'll bring him back to our program and, 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 and put him on the transplant list, we would do that. Well, but we, have to. We, have to. We, have, we have done that sort of thing. But this patient has no exit strategy, and the proper answer is this poor patient needs hospice. And we need palliative care and comfort, not the false light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. 
There is no right to die on that one. Case two, 38-year-old overweight woman, H1N1 influenza pneumonia. BB ECMO started with 31 French Avalon, good flows, sweep of six, 100% oxygen on the BV, it's now at day 13. Ventilator set at uh, PIPA 10, peak pressure 20, 40% oxygen, cut of volume at 35. 40% oxygen there. Post oxygenator gas looks like that. P7.45, PCO2 37, PO2 410. Oxygen is working. Patient gas 737, 45, PO2 is 49, set of 82. Fanning is normal. She's making urine. LP is normal. Um, you had to kind of pester her when you were drawing these gases because she's texting on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you got this low sat. What should you do? A, call RT, increase the FO2 in the ventilator. Little tiger text me at the same time as you're doing this. You can call RT to increase the tidal volume in the ventilator. Call RT to increase both the FO2 and the tidal volume. D, ask perfusion to increase the circuit flow to improve delivery of oxygenated blood. E, I still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and F, none of the above. So you've got the, I'm going to change slides, and then you've got the same thing again. Yeah, somebody's really fast every time. The only downside of this system right now is it doesn't tell you how many people are participating. By the way, it's the only way I actually make money off of this because I get all the text postings. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, everybody voted? Yeah. Not yet. Still chances to get it right. Wise to the examiner. Sorry? <laughs> I got wise to the examiner. You think that the answer might be none of the above? <laughs> you know, one brave soul is going to go out. Go out. <laughs> Well, you know, at least they're tiger texting. <laughs> you know, at least they're tiger texting. They're 50% right. <laughs> okay, so the answer here is indeed F. Um, this patient's doing great. I mean, you know, there's nothing here to suggest we have any problem at all. We've got rest ventilator settings. She's doing fan. All the organs are working. The brain is working. Um, and I don't care what the sand is. Everything's fine. We're not going to mess with anything. This patient should get better. Okay, we're going to move on to VA land. So VA ECMO, remember this is the one that supports the heart, not the lungs directly. And it's for potentially reversible heart failure. Or if it's not going to get better, at least they have an end game. They can potential candidate for LVAD or a transplant. With or without lung disease, failing conventional aggressive management. Now you can use VA for pure heart failure, for pure lung failure. It's just that in general, it's much more complicated and riskier to do that. But you can still support lungs with VA. But there's rare circumstances where that'd be the right answer. That'd be F. Okay, so conditions that might be reasonable to do, congestive heart failure, acute MI, decompensated cardiomyopathy, PE with acute RV failure, drug overdose with cardiotoxic medications such as calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, refractory arrhythmias, BP storm, LVAD failure such as pump thrombosis or somebody takes scissors to the drive line. We've seen that, okay? So these would all be reasonable indications for um, VA ECMO. Now what is aggressive conventional management? Well, that's kind of a controversial you know, what that consists of. Is it two vasopressors? Is it high dose epi? If it's high dose epi, how high? They have to have a balloon pump in already. But basically, you're failing whatever people think is reasonable aggressive management. So you've got a patient who's failing aggressive management and has some reason to think that if you can keep them alive, you can fix something or it's going to get better. Maybe they have a myocarditis that's going to run its course. Maybe they need to have a heart replaced. Maybe they just need their drugs adjusted. They need something. Maybe they need a stent in the coronary. 
you got some reason to think that you're going to get this patient out of here alive if you just keep them alive. This isn't for the end stage, no option sort of patient. VA cannulation could be either peripheral or central. And peripheral, again, we talked about fem fem, so we take it out of a, uh, out of a femoral vein, uh, typically advance up into the right atrium, and then you return the blood to the femoral artery, and it goes up the iliac and up the aorta and diffuses retrograde. And there's central, which can be done at the time of surgery, uh, lots of drainage strategies. And you can sort of have this, and one thing we've done in some patients, we take it out of the femoral vein, but return it to the axillary artery. So there's all sorts of ways to do it, but all fundamentally, you take it out of the vein, return it to some big artery. Now, gas interpretation on the VA ECMO. Here, the ECMO circuit and the patient lungs are in parallel. They're not in series, they're in parallel. That one right next to the other. Again, it's very important to designate where the blood is drawn from. Right radial gases are often very different than left radial gases. It has to do with how the aortic arch works. I'll show some more pictures of that. Depending on cannulation strategy and cardiac function, the femoral blood gas may be totally different or perhaps even the same as a left radial gas or be completely different or the same as a right radial gas. So as before, we have a pre gas we can draw. The pre gas, this one does not have any recirculation. Remember, we're not returning any blood. So this is a central venous gas. This is just like your standard central venous gas. You can trend this like you would any other central venous gas. It changes with anemia, tissue oxygen consumption, cardiac output, just like you're, like you're used to. That's easy. It's the only thing that's easy. Venous post-oxygenator, again, is identical to VV ECMO, tells us how well the oxygenator is working. But it's important to recognize this blood that comes out of the oxygenator is going straight into your body. It's not getting diluted with anything. It's not mixing with anything. This post-oxygenator blood is what your body is seeing. So if the PCO2 is too low or too high, if the PO2 is too low or too high, that's what you're giving to the patient. Okay. So even though our PO2 post-oxygenator in VV may be 450, it'll never be 450 in the patient because it's mixing with all this other blood that didn't go through there. But if your PO2 is 450 in the oxygenator in, in VA, that is what you're giving your patient. And it turns out that too much oxygen, especially following anoxic brain injury, can perhaps be more dangerous than not enough oxygen. They get a bunch of free radicals and nasties that can happen. So we actually don't want to have the PO2 be too high in VA ECMO. And then there's a the patient blood gas. Problem is that it's not patient blood gas, it's sort of patient blood gases. Because depending on where you measure it, the patient will have a different blood gas. If the heart is not ejecting, there, if there is no LV ejection, then all of the patient blood gases will be the same as the post oxygenator gas. So think about that. If you've got blood coming up the aorta or maybe out the axillary artery, you're filling up the aorta with blood coming out of the oxygenator. Nothing is being pumped out by the heart. So the entire aorta, all of its branches, brain, hand, liver, gut, everything is going to have the gases the same as what came out of the oxygenator. If the heart is pumping, if the LV is ejecting, the aorta got little things, blood coming out, where that blood come from? It came from the lungs. If your lungs are good, and your ventilator settings are good, that's fine. You got nice red blood coming out of the uh, heart. That's great. If you got pulmonary edema, or maybe you aspirated, or something else has gone wrong with your lungs, then, depending on what your ventilator settings are, whether it's coming out of your LV, maybe badly hypoxic blood. And what's the first artery that comes off of the aorta so the LV is squeezing blood up the aorta. What's the very first artery that you run into? Not quite. Coronary. Coronary. Coronary arteries. So the heart is bathing itself with hypoxic blood. How does that work for the heart in terms of recovery? Okay, not good. So right off the bat, you've got a sick heart. Let's say you got some sick lungs. You want VA ECMO. And the heart is trying to pump. And it is, but it's pumping out blood that is hypoxic. 
and that's only going to worsen cardiac recovery issues. So a lot of challenges here. The first artery that we can actually measure things, we can't measure coronary artery sats, we can use as a surrogate the right radial artery. The right radial artery, the right arm, comes off of the right subclavian, and it's one of the earlier branches off the aorta. So if the right radial is blue, the right radial, maybe we can do that later. If the right, if the right radial is blue, then we know that our coronary artery is blue also. So we have a problem. Can we ask her to maybe come back? Thank her, but maybe later. So anybody that's on, that's going on ECMO, VA ECMO, what we would like is to have them um, uh, have a right radial uh, AB, uh, art one place. Do not want to see anybody coming the OR with just a left radial. Really messed up management forever. So as I said, venous preoxygenator, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> venous preoxygenator um, is just like a regular mixed venous gas. Post oxygenator tells us how that how that's working, and the patient arterial gas tells us all sorts of things about the patient that are often hard to sort out. And the other thing is, this will change over time. That sick heart may eject at some times and may not eject at other times. So you may see that at various times, you're getting perfusion entirely from the ECMO circuit. At other times, you're getting a combination of patient LV pumping coupled with ECMO circuit. That heart may beat for 10 minutes and quit. It may go for two hours and then slow down. It may never go. It may go all the time. So it's a dynamic process. And then just to remind the situation, coronary arteries coming off at the, at the beginning. Then we have brachiocephalic going to the right subclavian and the, and the carotid. And we get the left sided circuit. And depending on where, how far up the blood goes as it's being pumped out, before it runs into the afterload, of the blood coming from the ECMO circuit depends on where that break point is. And it's not going to get all mixy in there and everything just turn into a happy mixing. There's basically a line of demarcation. Okay? There's actually a demarcation <laughs> line. And this is an aortogram shot from below in a patient who's on VA ECMO. So down low, this is, this is the aorta. And blood is going up the aorta and we see left-sided structures, mm -hmm. and here's brachiocephalic, mm -hmm. but where's the heart and the first part of the arch? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason you don't see that is because the patient's ejecting blood. So blood is coming out of the heart, bathing itself in coron coronaries, coming up, and it actually runs into, not a brick wall, but it runs into a blood wall. It is running into the blood coming out of the ECMO circuit. Now, if I turn the ECMO flow down, what would happen? This would go further down that way, and maybe the break point would be here. If I turn the ECMO flow up, it might be further back that way. If I change the blood pressure, that will change. If I lower the map, then the LV will eject more. If I raise the map, the LV will eject less. You can, this break point is going to change. And depending on where that break point is, my right sided pulse oximeter may show that the patient is having blood coming from here, from his heart, rather than from the ECMO circuit. Okay? This is complicated stuff. I don't, I don't pretend that everybody's going to understand all this right now. Just sort of get, let it percolate, read over the notes, ask questions. This is very, very complicated. And like I said, it changes, sometimes almost beat to beat on these patients. Literally, we've had patients who we put echo, uh, look at their echo, and their aortic valve does not open every beat. Maybe it's every second or every third beat the aortic valve goes. So this is a highly dynamic process. So you need enough ECMO flow to support the patient, but too much flow and pressure and afterload hinders LV ejection and LV recovery. And at times the LV may not be ejecting at all, and the aortic valve never opens. That is another problem that can lead to the need to do something called LV decompression. 
That's also on the list of things that is beyond the scope of this talk. That, that's another hour discussion on LD decompression strategy, how to do it, when to do it, if it works, how to avoid it. Um, these are incredibly sick patients. Nobody's almost nobody's sicker than the VA for patients. Yes. Um, so the whole fact, I think you said that you wanted to get AVGs off the right radio. Right. Um, would you want the ball pass on the right side? Right and left. Right and left. I'd like to have two pulse extenders, right and left. And, and I've had patients where the right side is, you know, 72, and the left, side, the left hand is uh, 98. And it's not wrong. These patients are usually on vasopressors, high doses, they have respiratory failure, often have renal failure. The large number of these patients are on dialysis. They often have shock liver. They're lactic acidemic. And, and these, you know, you don't go on VA ECMO usually as a previously healthy person. Okay? I mean, you can't. Anybody in this room can come down with myocarditis tomorrow and be on ECMO next Tuesday. Okay? And you don't have vascular disease, it's just bad luck. But the majority of these people, smoke, they've got lung disease, they've got vascular disease, they've got diabetes, they have something, and cannulation complications are common, these are challenging, you have atherosclerotic disease, somebody in an emergency situation tries to cram a 21 French cannula up your leg, um, there are all sorts of issues. Uh, by the way, another thing kind of beyond the scope of the top is leg perfusion strategies, um, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff in that mode, but this is just skimming the surface. Initial management, established circuit flow. Um, often there are a lot of volume issues, you get chatter problems. This is a population of patients that um, are very challenging to manage. You don't need to turn the ventilator down if it's just pure VA ECMO. The lungs aren't the problem. So keep the ventilator settings the way they were. It's really important to do that because anything that comes out of the heart has been through those lungs. If you turn down the ventilator, you're guaranteeing that you're going to have problems with any blood that comes out. So keep the ventilator, unless you got horrible ARDS, keep the ventilator where it is. Decrease the vasopressors. Flow is more important than pressure. And often we'll take maps in the 50 to 60 range. Okay. Check the patient and circuit gases. Adjust the circuit settings based on the post oxygenator gas. Here you adjust the ventilator settings based on the right radial ABG unless the LV is not ejecting. So if the LV is not ejecting, in other words, that right radial is exactly the same as a post oxygenator, then it doesn't matter what you do to the ventilator, it won't affect anything because the blood is not coming out of the lungs. But if the two are separate and you are getting blood flow out of the heart, then you adjust the ventilator settings to the right radial gas and you adjust the ECMO settings to the post oxygenator gas. That sort of makes sense. Okay, this is this is um, this is confusing. Decide if therapeutic hypothermia is indicated or not. Okay, um, it may be. Often these patients have had a period of anoxia. They may have had a formal arrest. And you want to chill them. Cannulocyte bleeding extremely common. VV, relatively rare, VA, <coughs> almost universal. Make sure the leg is adequately perfused if it's femoral cannulation. It's a medical emergency if it's not adequately perfused. I like to follow uh, NIOV on those patients. Um, um, address timing and goals of anticoagulation. Very challenging. Initial management, early echo, either TTE or transesophageal. Important question is the aortic valve opening. Now you may be able to tell this from just a monitor. If your patient has no balloon pump and you have pulse fertility, your heart's beating. If you have a balloon pump, it's easy to think your heart's beating as you see a spike. Turn off the balloon for a little bit. It goes flatline, the heart's not ejecting. Um, do you need dialysis? If so, it'll always be CRRT. And does the patient need a VV ECMO circuit in addition? Another important question. The middle phase begins as soon as you get this patient stabilized. And the goal is to have the LV ejecting with most or all beats. Adequate tissue perfusion, how to get organ recovery. Adequate anticoagulation without bleeding. 
start at least trophic two feedings, do all the basic stuff to keep this patient alive. But the important things here where I didn't really mention and should have is we have to be working on LV recovery and then exit strategies. So we're either gonna get that part better or we're gonna need to support it with an LVAD or replace it with a transplant. Those are the only three options. So if it gets better, gets supported chronically, or gets replaced. And it's never too early to start planning those strategies. Weaning BAF mode is much harder than weaning VB. VB is simple. VA is hard. While on VA ECMO, the LV tends to be underfilled. If you're draining huge amounts of blood from the patient from the right side, that blood doesn't go and fill up the LV. So you've got an LV that is sick, but it's underfilled. And it's never going to have a good ejection fraction until it gets some blood in it. So often, echocardiographic assessment looks worse than it really is. You say, oh, that heart's not really beating very well. It's not squeezing well. Yeah, but it's also underfilled. So it may not be as bad as it looks. In VV, we turn down the sweep. In VA, we need to turn down the flow. So we turn down the flow of the circuit. And as we turn the flow down, we're doing two things. One is we're taking less venous blood out. So the LV will start to fill and can, can contract better. And we're also not supporting the blood pressure and left-sided flow with ECMO as much which will also encourage LV injection. So we turn that down and see what happens. And as we do that, either the patient's blood pressure tanks and they say some bad words and put them back on or blood pressure does pretty well and things look pretty good. Now, as we turn down the flow, there's a risk of circuit thrombosis. So we actually have to have these patients very well anticoagulated during, uh, during this period. And the question is how long, you know, you know, when the patient can tolerate low, v, very low VA ECMO support without excessive inotropic support, then we can decannulate. So how low is low and how long is long enough and how much inotropic support is too much, but those, those become the questions. And again, you really don't want to decannulate and decide, nah, let's put it back on. Okay. So this, this, is, this is very challenging, difficult uh, decisions. So, another case. 52 year old man had a large anterior wall MI. He was in cardiogenic shock, worsening LFTs, pulmonary edema, rising gravity. He's put on emergency FemFem VA ECMO. Map is 63. He's got good pulsatilities on the monitor. And on echocardiogram, his aortic valve opens on your rebeat. Post oxygenator gas, we've turned his oxygenator down to 40%. And those are his post oxygenator gases. PCO240, pH 7.42, PCO244, PO294. His right radial gas, he's on fairly standard ventilator settings, rate of 14. pH is 7.31, PCO2 is 56, PO2 is 48, 81% set. Okay? Based on that low PO2 and the right radial ABG, you should A, increase FO2 and or peak, trying to get a stab over 87. B, increase the FO2 on the ECMO circuit from 0.4 to 0.6. C, leave everything alone. Saturation 81% is fine on ECMO. D, what, what is ECMO? And E, none of the above. <laughs> and E is none of the above. There is a learning curve here. This is going much faster than it used to. This is great. <laughs> That's awesome. This is pretty damn cool. I like this. <laughs> I should have had more questions. <laughs> okay. Oh. Some people are changing their answers. <laughs> Okay, we're done. So, um, answer here is A. B is a close runner-up in terms of right answer. Uh, C is, this is not B, A, this is not B, B, ECMO, this is B, A, ECMO. So, this is a patient 
who has pulmonary edema or ARDS and actually not eczema, it's edema. Um, <laughs> and our standard ventilator management for ARDS or pulmonary edema would include more PEEP and more FiO2. And we can go up on these and try to get better oxygenation. And we could follow the ARDS protocol, which would be fine. We could have physicians say, let's go up on the PEEP and go up on the oxygen sub and not follow a protocol per se. But the concept is we're going to increase oxygenation by making some ventilator settings. Remember, we've got lungs in parallel here, not in series. So we've got to get the blood going to this patient's heart and brain better oxygenated if possible. And we can do it safely because we're on such low settings right now. We're only on 40% of PEEP to 5. We could easily go to 7.5 or 10 on the PEEP easily go to 60 or 70 percent oxygen without getting into danger zones. Now, if we find ourselves on 90 percent oxygen and a PEEP of 16 and a SAT of 72, well then we got to start doing something else. But right now we can manage this patient's lungs by managing the ventilator, which is completely different than BV. The fact that the word ECMO is in there, the answer isn't, if you're on ECMO you don't touch the ventilator. The answer is if you're on VV ECMO and we're in the lung protective phase of management, we don't touch the ventilator. If we're in VA ECMO and we can safely make adjustments in the ventilator to improve oxygenation, then we should. These are completely different concepts. And again, this is very complicated. Now there's VV ECMO. This is where it gets confusing. Uh, everything else is pretty straightforward. So, I don't think I, I don't think this one is um, uh, this, this we're going to walk through the questions. I don't think this one is a vote. So, a 50 year old man has a VF arrest and is resuscitated. He goes to the cath lab. EF is 15 percent. And while there, he aspirates. He's tubed. He has multiple more arrests. LAD stent is placed. He's hypotensive on high dose epinephrine, and his PO2 is 37. What do you do? We only have until 9.30. <laughs> what do you want to do? Okay, we'll put my VA ECMO. I think that's a good idea. Um, he's young. He's got coronary disease. Um, good chance of having some sort of exit strategy. We don't know for sure that he does, but it's reasonable. He's failing high-dose epinephrine. We can't keep him saturated. He's aspirated. He's going to die if we don't do something. So I think VA ECMO is reasonable. What route? We'll go to the OR, do a cut down on his axillary artery. Go fem fem. It's fast. So we begin emergency VA ECMO via fem fem route. And with that, he has an immediate improvement in blood pressure and saturation. His rhythm stabilizes. And as, on his monitor, his MAP is 88. He's got zero pulsatility, flat one. He's on 100% oxygen, tidal volume of 410, rate of 26. ECMO flow is 5.1, sweep is 4 liters. We turn it down to 80%. And initial right radial gas, 715, 29, 280. And his post oxygenator, ABG, is 716, 28, 284. What's going on here? So first of all, what do you notice about those two gases? They're the same. They're the same. So they're, they're the same, right? 280 versus 284 doesn't matter. These are the same. The blood coming out of his oxygenator is what's coming out of his right radial. So there's no pulse fertility. His heart is not pumping anything. It might, it might be beating, but it's not, it's not squeezing out. For all practical purposes, he's a PEA. Okay? Pulse is electrical activity. There's no pulse. There's electrical activity. Rhythm stabilized. So is that good? Do they have no output from there? No, it's bad. That LV can actually clot. Mm -hmm. The whole LV can thrombose. There's no flow. The aortic arch can clot. Bad. 
Okay? That's on the list of bad things. So we want to get some pulsatility. How do we make that happen? Okay, we got to see one person says turn down the flow. The flow is 5.1. What else could we do? Okay, someone said inotropes. That's a possibility to try to make the heart beat stronger. I'm going to bet he's already on that. Hmm? Uh, pacing isn't the, uh, isn't the issue. Uh, we have electrical activities rhythm is stable, so pacing won't help. What do you think about that map? Okay, the map is way too high. Okay, so if he's on that base, maybe you want to go down on that. So we want to go down on pressors if they're on sky high doses. We may want to add a vasodilator if we're using the FE for LV contractility purpose, if we're using it for its inotropic effects and squeeze the heart, we may want to add a vasodilator and we have perhaps more flow than we need. So we could decrease pressors, we could decrease flow, we could add a vasodilator. We're going to shoot for a map somewhere closer to maybe 60 rather than 88. So, and when we did the echocardiogram, by the way, the uh, LV was dilated, almost akinetic, aortic valve not opening. So, severely injured LV, it's unsuccessful at trying to pump against a high after load and turn down the flow, turn down the pressors, aim for a lower map. Now, the question of adding a balloon pump, that might, again, this is a little bit of um, beyond scope. Uh, this gets into the whole arena of trying to decompress a OB that's not emptying. And if we did all those things and we did not get pulsatility, we could put an impella in to try to suck out the OB. We could add a balloon pump, probably won't work. We've actually gone to surgery and put a cannula to the OB apex and sucked blood out that way. Um, and put that into the ECMO circuit with several different things we've done. Our preference in general lately has been in color. Uh, and that's worked reasonably well. But turning down, we turned down the flow, turned down the pressors, then we added a vasodilator. Now we got a map of 62. Pulsatility on the waveform, on the, on the monitor. Echo shows the aortic valve is opening with every beat. But the right radial sat is now 68%. It used to be 99, and now it's 68. We have cerebral oximetry, it's falling. And the left radio set is 99. Right radio gas has a PO2 of 35 and a PCO2 of 55. Left radial looks like the oxygenator. What's going on? The lungs are cracked. That's the official. That's the official. <laughs> that's the official <laughs> diagnosis from the second row. And, uh, I, I would concur with that diagnosis. Yeah, LAC, uh, lungs are crap. So, and and just show you again there, um, bad lungs, pumping out blue blood, bathing the coronaries, coming out here right radial, then we got red blood coming up the aorta and getting the left arm, and then somewhere between here and there, we don't know where, is the break point. But we have falling pulse oximetry, uh, cerebral oximetry, so at least one, if not both carotids aren't doing well. So we gotta do something here. So that is a, so there's an interesting comment just made, which could be the right answer under some emergency situation. So we could increase the flow and say, well, as bad as it was before with the, over, uh, with the heart not being able to recover, it's even worse now with hypoxia in the brain. Let's just increase the flow and send red blood throughout the entire aorta and, and stop the aortic valve opening. And that actually could be an emergency situation you could do. Okay, so an emergency situation where things are really, wheels are coming off, you've got to do something we could actually do that, but it's not a good long-term solution and has serious drawbacks. But that actually is not a bad thing to think about and 
and could be the right answer under some circumstances. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, we want to provide better oxygenation rather than overload the heart. We can either fix the lungs, so diuretics or whatever, probably can't do that quickly. We could try to make ventilator <coughs> changes, improve the, increase the peak, change the FiO2, or if we have exhausted those, we can throw in a BV circuit. Again, this is just a reminder, same picture we saw before, blood coming out of the heart, running into blood coming into the aorta. In this patient, we decided, we, we, made, we went through a series of changes, did the best we could with the ventilator, but couldn't do any more. We put a, add, sorry, add a VV circuit in addition to the VA circuit. And what this does, it provides hyperoxygenated blood with CO2 removed to the right side, and then that right-sided blood can be pumped by the sick heart through the sick lungs and out the LV. So it bathes the coronaries and the brain and the right arm with blood that has oxygen in it and not as much CO2. And at the same time, we continue some blood for VA. So we add a ECMO circuit to the VV, we drain blood from the veins, part of it comes back to the right, part of it comes back to the left. VV and the VA circuit, not VVA. We've done this a variety of ways. We can add an Avalon double lumen, right IJ. We can add another femoral line. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but when you're done, you've got a VV circuit distinct from the VA. And then you split the flow and some of it goes back to the vein, some of it goes back to the artery. Okay, advanced question. You've got blood coming out of the circuit, and half of it, you have blood coming out of the circuit, and then some of it's routed to the right atrium, and some of it is routed to the aorta. Where is the blood going to go? Where will most of the blood go? Will it be split even? Will most of it go to the aorta, or most of it go to the right atrium? Right atrium. Right atrium. Why? Pressure. Low pressure, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the pressure is lower there, and blood takes the path of least resistance, right? So we actually have to put a clamp on the venous outflow so that the pressure goes up and it doesn't all go to the right side. So we put two put two flow monitors on so we know how much blood flow is coming out of the circuit and we know how much is going to either the right or left and doing some simple subtraction you know which one or the other one. So we may have five liters coming out of our ECMO circuit and if we've got two liters going to the aorta then that's three liters going to the lungs. So you just adjust it until you get sats that are where you want it and pressure where you want it. He's okay. What if instead of same thing you just play with the diameter of the with the movement of the, the catheter? So the question is can you, wait, so the question is, relates to how do you fundamentally make that happen and say clamp it, you are limiting the, the, the lumen. So the first time we did this we used a very sophisticated device uh, from Home Depot. <laughs> uh, actually I joke, it was Lowe's. Um, but it's it's one of those uh, you know little clampy things and you pump it and the clamp comes together. We we had one of those. Um, and I have a picture of that. So we used that and it worked fine. Uh, since then we actually have a true little clamp that we use. But uh, you have to clamp the outflow or we'll all go back to the, you have a pure VV, you won't have any VA because of the high pressure. Um, and this works fine. And then very briefly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about anticoagulation when we're done. And anticoagulation on ECMO, there is no simple algorithm. When I first started, I just wanted everybody, I wanted somebody's algorithm from their program. And nobody would send me anything. And they just tell me what they measured. And the reason is, nobody has an algorithm. Every center is a little different. Most centers use heparin. A few centers use arcaptorban, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. But we use heparin and less greater contraindication. And we have some very simple goals. We don't want bleeding anywhere. We don't want clots in the circuit. And if the patient were to bleed, we want the, the patient to clot. So you want no bleeding, 
But if there is bleeding, you want to clot. We don't want clots in the circuit. Okay, show of hands, how often does that happen? <laughs> so, we follow a bunch of tests. We get daily tags and PRN. We get heparin assays, typically every four to six hours. We have PT, INR daily. Follow playlists, follow antithrombin-3. Heparin works through the enzyme antithrombin-3. If that's low, heparin doesn't work as well. That's why we follow it. And the goal here is we simply adjust these things, trying to, we, we adjust our heparin kind of you know, I'm, I'm, it's basically voodoo. Um, uh, it, it, it's basically voodoo. We, we want a heparin assay in the 0.3 to 0.5 range. We find that tends to work pretty well for us. Most <coughs> of the time, but not always. I like my TEG pre-heparinase about 30 minutes for the R. I like the post-heparinase TEG to be basically normal without any other pyganopathy. I like my PTINR to be normal. I want my playlist over 50,000. I want my antithrombin 3 in a reasonable range, but I can't tell you what that number is without knowing more about the patient because sometimes we accept lower values without problem. And, um, you know, you can't always get what you want. Um, it's just the way that's going to go. Um, and, you know, you look at the patient. How are they doing? Are they oozing from the cannulas? Are they having more clot forming somewhere? Well, if they're oozing, uh, we've got a problem. The forming clots may have a problem. So you've got to make adjustments. Is the oozing because you need another stitch? Or are you oozing because you have a phygalopathy? Are you clotting because you've got low flow? Are you clotting because they're thrombotic? Um, our 83 um, um, day run patient uh, was an incredibly thrombogenic patient who went through, I think, eight circuits. Uh, some of the emergency circuit changes for thrombosis. We've never had a circuit thrombosis before. She clotted her pump a few times. And by the end, we had her on um, um, warfarin, I think Plavix, and definitely um, a heparin. And the heparin assay, we kept not 0.3 to 0.5, but 0.7 to 1. So we had her on high, high doses of everything to keep the circuit from clotting. So, uh, and meanwhile, we have other patients who, under some circumstances, we've run them without heparin uh, and have done okay. So there is no straightforward answer as to how to manage heparin uh, or anticoagulation in these patients. It's really going to be variable. And then I have this out of order. Uh, just a bunch of lab we follow on ECMO patients. Uh, basic CMP, looking at you know, hepatic and uh, uh, renal function. CBC, looking for infection, and where you're, where you're bleeding, uh, coags, uh, gases, and all sorts of places. LDH, looking for hemolysis. Half the globin is for hemolysis, and plasma free hemoglobin is for hemolysis. So there's a series of hemolysis labs that we look at, and these will go up under a variety of circumstances. And again, another area that is sort of beyond scope is uh, hemolysis management recognition. Troubleshooting real fast. If everything is working, the patient is well saturated, then the blood going into the ECMO circuit is going to be dark, the blood coming out is going to be red, ECMO circuit flow is stable, typically around four liters. That's what you want. If the blood coming out of the circuit is red, and the flow is where it has been, and your patient is having a problem, the problem is not the oxygenator. Okay? So if the flow is four liters, and the blood coming out of the oxygenator is red, and your patient is having a problem, it's not the oxygen. The blood coming out is red and the flow is good. Drawing gases there isn't going to tell you anything. You already know the oxygen is not the problem. If the blood coming out of the circuit is dark, <coughs> then the problem is either the oxygen has been turned off, so we turned the wrong knob, or the tubing has come off, or your oxygen has clotted, in which case the flow would be down. So if, you, if your patient's having a problem and you look at the blood coming out of the oxygen and it's dark, that's the problem. You don't need a gas. The blood coming out is dark. And your patient's having a problem. So, did somebody turn down the flow? Turn it back on. Did the little tubing come off? There's no alarm. Put it back on. And then if the pressures are high and your flow is at four liters is one and a half, that's your problem. You've got a circuit problem. Okay? Very, very straightforward. If the blood going into the circuit is bright red, you have recirculation. Okay? 
only way that can happen, blood going into the circuit is bright red, your recirculation. Either you have a low patient cardiac output or a cannula is a migrator. Very simple. So look at your circuit, ask yourself, what color is the blood, what are the flows? You should know that on your patient. Okay, so when you assess your patient, what does the blood look like? The reason you want to know that is so that if there's a problem, you can say, that's not the way it looked before. It used to be dark and red, and now they're both dark. It used to be dark and red, now they're both red. You don't have a situation where, yeah, it doesn't look right, I don't know what it looked like before. You don't need gases very often in an emergency. You need to just do it quick, you need to know where you were and what it looks like now. And again, another talk, advanced troubleshooting, management of bleeding, uh, managing these patients without any coagulation, ECPR, whole series of, of other talks that we don't have time for. And we actually are precisely out of time, although I can stay later if there are any other questions or, or comments. So I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer questions. So um, if you have to leave, feel free to leave, time is up. Okay, anybody have any questions? Yeah, I expect you will have questions over the next days as you take care, as you digest this, and especially when you start seeing patients. We do have a patient C3 is on DBF right now, so uh, anybody who's managing that patient, see something that they have questions about, ask. Uh, as I said, this is, uh, I think, the most complicated thing that we do. The sickest patients are extremely complicated. I think that's what makes it fun, is that it's uh, um, so challenging. If you understand the physiology, it gets easy. Um, and you've done this a whole lot. This actually is very easy stuff, but it won't be for a long time. All right, thank you.